This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Good morning, and thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Abram Nanny, my producer, and we are talking about mood and heat. You know, the warnings about the dangers of the heat on your body are, are out there everywhere. I know you've heard them over and over again. We know that, that this extreme heat that we are not used to can wreak havoc and even kill if we're not careful. Today, though, I want to talk about something that you may not realize, that extreme heat can also be devastating to your mood. It can impair your concentration. We know it hurts sleep. Um, Most people cannot sleep in extreme heat. And therefore, it can diminish your general sense of well-being. So I want to talk about what we should be doing and what we should not be doing as we move through this. You know, I was laughing as I was um, going to my car to come in, Abram. Uh, We have this uh, cool front that has come down, so we're going to have two days of only 90-degree weather. Oh, thank goodness. (laughs) man! 80 80 degrees would be nice right now, but 90, uh, I'll settle for that. Yeah, I I will say, it does feel a little better. There's a little bit of a breeze out there. So, listeners, if you can, just go outside for a minute, get just a little bit of sunlight and a little bit of that not extreme heat, because we know that's good for us, too. Staying inside in darkness with the blinds or curtains closed all day long is also not good for us. But but this this oppressive heat that we have had is different than what we Southerners are typically used to. And although we occasionally get 100 degree, degree weather, this is this is sort of topped out on a regular basis. Doesn't seem very occasional right now. No, it seems it pretty constant for the past three weeks or so. Right. And and so if if you are feeling a little bit of foggy brain, more irritable, maybe more fatigued, maybe not motivated as you usually are, there really is a reason for it. And so when those temp spikes go up, there are data that have shown us that, unfortunately, suicide rates go up, crime rates often go up, and violence, road rage, all of those things. The meanness, if you start looking Sometimes the lack of tolerance, the way people talk to each other, is a little bit more snappy. Uh, the, the, the meanness on the interstate, the meanness on social media often uh, comes up. And there, there's reason for that, as I've said before. And, and some of it can relate back to serotonin levels. Uh, the serotonin is one of those neurochemicals that is necessary for happiness, uh, but it also does help with thermal reg- regulation. And so it can affect and lower the the uh, levels of serotonin, this extreme heat, as the body's trying to, to adjust. Now, it doesn't seem like some of the other neurochemicals are as sensitive, but we also know that extreme heat can elevate your cortisol levels, which we've talked about. Increased cortisol levels happen when we're stressed. Uh, Our cortisol level goes up when we have that fight-or-flight reaction. So... What can happen is extreme heat can increase anxiety and increase depression, even when we're not, actually. 
See, I've heard of the opposite of that before, but I've never heard of the heat doing it. Like, I've heard of seasonal affective disorder. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. mostly, maybe it's just me, but I've associated that with, like, winter and, like, the the holidays and stuff. But I I guess that probably also applies to the heat as well. Right. Thermal regulation. But, But typically the seasonal affective disorder is mostly caused by... The levels of darkness, our shortened days um, in in the South, particularly, we have a lot of very cloudy, rainy days that can affect our mood. Now, I think many of us right now would love to have a cloudy, rainy day. Just one. Yeah, just, just one just would a, be nice. A few that would be <laughs> soothing and calming. So that balance is really good for us. And and what most of the experts are saying is that it truly is not so much heat. It's the the extreme fluc- fluctuations that happen. And the prolonged time. Now, what does happen, it seems, again, there's still more research that needs to be done in this, believe it or not. There is ongoing research now, but I still hear a little little bit of questioning if you look in the research about how much of this is absolute. But I will say that it does seem that we can sort of what we call have tachyphylaxis or equilibration. So if we have ongoing heat, that sort of continual, gradually those serotonin levels will adjust and the cortisol levels will adjust. There's one caveat, though. You have to be able to sleep to adjust to that. So the very first thing I want to say is in this extreme heat, I know everybody's trying not to spend thousands of dollars on utilities, and it's better to keep your thermostat up in the day as high in your home as you can tolerate it. So don't don't tone it down all the way to 72 when you're, you're having your air conditioners or central air and heat or whatever working against 105 degree weather. But what you can do is, if you can, keep it above 80. And I know there's some people struggling out there who have no air conditioning, and that's when it gets really tough. And we need to keep in mind those people and help them out. And one of the recommendations out there is if you are one of those individuals who do not, who does not have the luxury of having central air and heat or a window unit that can you can go into a room and have it well cooled, is to go to public spaces that are cooled. So it can be very life-saving. The other thing I know you've heard on every single single of our Southern Remedy shows, but I'm just going to repeat it again because it affects mood, too, because intolerance to heat and mood and hydration level are connected. So... Um, In one study, they looked at individuals who drank at least six eight-ounce glasses of water a day during extreme heat, and those individuals had better levels of serotonin, better mood levels in general. And so to make sure that you have yourself hydrated, and if you are feeling especially fatigued, um, if you feel especially fatigued, then then you make yourself drink more fluid. I think that's going to be something very important for us to remember. So as we're we're talking and moving along, we want to make sure that we're not compounding the stressors on us during during all of this um, because, of the climate trauma that we're talking about can interfere and compound what those of us who have mental health disorders are already dealing with. 
Okay. That's Does that make I, sense? Yeah, I saw this looking up at um, schizophrenia specifically. Like they schizophrenic people already have problems regulating their body temperature, apparently. So that can really exacerbate their mental performance when they're already struggling with mental health issues. Right. Another another issue, and and I'll just mention this, but particularly with medications, there are some medications that either the medications can be interfered with by the dehydration effect that extreme heat can have, or it can interfere with the ability of our body to adjust to the extreme heat. We're talking about mood and heat and how it can can affect your general mood, your sense of well-being. It can also affect your thinking, your concentration, your ability to make snap judgments. And I'll talk a little bit about some studies that have been shown to cause some issues, um, but let's talk first a little bit about some of the medicine. I want, I want to just talk about the fact that I had a patient's mother call. Yeah, I, I continue to see some children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and the mother called and said, you know, my child is, is just seeming to be more lethargic. He's not thinking very well. We're having some difficulties, and, and um, he's not tolerating his soccer practices at all. And she said, I wonder, could it be the medicines? And I was so grateful she called because I looked up his medication, and one of them was clonidine, which is a central acting antihypertensive medicine that's been approved for use for children with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and it is very helpful with the hyperactivity and the difficulty with sleep settling for some children. So it's used in children and adults, not as much now for hypertension, but as much for those things I mentioned. And um, that is one of the medicines that, due to the fact that it can lower your blood pressure a little bit, it can, even at the doses used for ADHD, it can also lower your heart rate, and it sort of lowers your body's ability to react to the heat, to increase blood flow and the like for cooling and sweating and all. And so the answer was, yes, indeed. Be very careful. Make sure he's well hydrated. Make sure that you watch if he looks like he could potentially be getting overheated to bring him inside to cool down because that's something to keep in mind. And there are other medicines, too, that I'll mention quickly and you can certainly call in and ask other questions. I'll ask them, answer them if I can. But to keep in mind, as you're looking at tolerating heat in these extreme issues, especially some of the antihypertensives like some of the diuretics that sometimes renal patients or people with significant high blood pressure or heart patients will use, um, Lasix, uh, the, the generic name is furosemide, diureal, hydrochlorothiazide, hydrodiureal, um, are some of those that can, can really cause some significant problems if you're not watching your level of hydration. Um, another one we mentioned earlier, a medicine that is used um, not for schizophrenia as much, but for bipolar disorder, uh, lithium, uh, can certainly also cause issues. So keep those in mind. And if you're not sure about whether or not your med medication can be affecting your heat tolerance or if there's something that you really need to be aware of, I would encourage you to call your pharmacist. Our pharmacists are wonderful resources for making sure that you clearly understand all the side effects of your medicine. So don't forget to use them as a good good resource. What are the, the typical things you should look out for as you're, you know, progressing in the heat and stuff? What, like, what are the signs that your medica medication could be affecting you? 
Well, feeling a rapid heart rate, uh, feeling extreme fatigue, overly tired, like you just don't have the energy to put one foot in front of the other, or redness and mottling of your skin. Um, You know, I, I think it was mentioned earlier on another show the the water wicking wonderful expensive exercise shirts that we wear now exercise clothes that we wear are not good in extreme heat because they wick the water away from you they take the sweat off your body and the sweat is used to evaporate and cool your body so to keep all that kind of stuff in mind but yeah that i think sometimes people misinterpret fatigue as just that that tiredness and that lethargy, gosh, couldn't get that word out, inability to move one foot in front of the other, that can be a sign that, that you're getting overheated and or dehydrated. So make sure about that. You're worrying me, Doc. No, no. That sounds a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs> lethargy. Okay, tiredness. Let's go to our first caller. We have Walker in Carroll County with some reflections. Hi, Walker. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Uh, I'm living in a pretty rural part of the Piney Hills above the Delta, but it gets hot up here, too, even with the shade of the trees. And uh, I went and bought myself a a cattle trough, put it on the deck, fill it with cold water, and uh, when I get real hot and sweaty, I'll just pop into it, clothes and all, and it'll... Uh, give the clothes the first rinse. It'll it'll uh, take my body core temperature down, and I'll you know do that for a couple of days. And the water starts uh, getting something I don't want to get into. It's like a lake, uh-huh. and I will uh, water the plants with it. So uh-huh. It's a good way to cool down and uh, recycle the water. Wow, what a wonderful idea. Walker, I'm a swimmer, and that's one thing that I've been able to continue to exercise because it's hard in this heat, especially people who love to exercise and are chronic exercises exercisers to be able to continue that so swimming is a wonderful way to do it the water can be a great cool off and even though right now pools can can hit up to 88 degrees in the water just because it's so heat hot outside you still have the ability to be able to cool your body down a little bit keeping in mind our our body temperature is 98 of course, so, a, a water uh, 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 cattle trough is a little bit short for swimming in. Uh, <laughs> the water coming out of the ground is really cool, and by the time it heats up, that's when you start using it for watering your plants. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you for that. Do you think it helps your mood when you jump in and cool off and do that? Absolutely. I think it does, too. You know, I don't know if I have told this story on on radio yet, but one of my uh, friend pediatricians in another area of the country, actually, he's not in another area. He's in Alabama. Uh, He is an individual who has stated openly that he has struggled a little bit with depression. And in his quest to improve his mood, he read about taking cold showers. And he it it said there there are some studies out there that that have shown that taking cold showers can elevate some individuals' moods by increases your increasing your endorphin levels, your serotonin and dopamine. And uh, so that is what he started doing. He also had been exercising on a regular basis and trying to lose a few pounds and found he couldn't lose that weight. He told us in a group that since he had been taking cold showers, not only did his utility bill drop, but also his he felt that his mood was elevated. He felt better, ready, able to embrace the day. And he had lo- lost 15 pounds that he had been trying to lose. So, of course, everybody in the meeting was intrigued and everyone wanted to give it a try but not many of us have but this would be a great time to remember when you get in the shower or the tub it's a good time to 
to take a cold shower. It really is. It can help you. I actually did that for a while. I Well, it was a long time ago, but I was pretty good about getting up and running in the morning. And then it was already hot, so the cold shower just kind of felt natural. And then, like, that was the cold shower was like, if nothing else, like the cold shower was already the worst part of my day. Like that was the the way to start off. So everything after the cold shower just like improved after after the day. So the day just completely changed because of the way you start off your day, if that makes any sense. Well, that's exactly what my friend in Alabama said. And so I would encourage others to try that if you if you can. It would not. There is no health reason that I can think of that you shouldn't do it. And if you can't do it all the way cold, you can do it um, a little bit cool and see if that helps. I think it'd be worth a try. And I'd love to hear from others out there if you've ever tried it, something like that. Or if you have other tips for staying cool, I think it would be good as we step through this show on how to improve our mental health. Obviously, for physical safety, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm minimizing that. But I do know that we in the South mostly know most of those tips. And so if you're already doing those, let's think about other things that we can do. So jump in, give us a call and talk to us about maybe some of your situations or some of your mood changes as you've dealt with this. We can talk about that anxiety or depression that maybe you're struggling with. Send an email to family at mpbonline.org. I want to talk, too, about a couple of other studies talking about concentration when, when you're experiencing heat. And probably during this time of year, I'm just going to throw this out there, probably in the heat of the summer, especially when we're dealing with extreme heat like we are, it is probably not a good time to make deep decisions. It's probably not a good time to test yourself. And it's probably not a good time to judge your cognitive function. If you feel like perhaps you're not thinking as well as you were a few months ago, Think about what you're dealing with and how much you're in the heat. If you have an outdoor job, I think be very careful if you're using any kind of dangerous equipment. This is a time to be very, very careful because there have there have been some studies that have looked at reaction time in the heat. And it seems that, and this doesn't sound like much, but think about it for those snap changes. For every degree of elevation when you get in extreme heat, for every excessive degree of elevation, it increases your reaction time by one second. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's scary. That's actually a a lot. (laughs) Like, that's pretty bad. Yeah. Now, that was one study. How we we all know we need du- duplicate studies to to be absolute, but we know that extreme heat can slow reaction time. So construction workers, um, people using you know equipment that can be dangerous, or or people on computers making snap decisions and doing something that can affect people long term. We've just got to be aware that we must be more careful. And then the other thing that I want to talk about after this next break is those temper flares, domestic violence, the amount of overreaction that we have, the amount of road rage uh, that, that goes on. Uh, when individuals are dealing with this kind of heat. So if if you've encountered someone who took you by surprise, if you saw something that happened that 
was just an out of the blue. I can't believe that just happened. Um, Love to hear from you. We can talk through that. Thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Abram Nanny. We're talking about mood, heat, but not just mood and heat, but cognitive function, the way you think, your reaction time, the way you're able to do tasks is are all affected by by this extreme heat. And that's why it's really important for us to do what we can do to protect ourselves and to cool ourselves. And to also choose not to make decisions at this time unless we need to. Make sure that we're getting all the rest and hydration that we can. And uh, like I said, I wanted to just talk to you about a couple of other studies that were done as we're moving along and and talk to you about some of the mistakes that we make, but also the domestic uh, violence issues. We have noted that there are increased issues with domestic violence during the summer in general, but during excessive heat specifically. But you may have heard this story. I believe NPR aired it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, There was a study done in Boston on young adults living in college dorm rooms during a heat wave. And they had some have ACs, and they slept in a cool 71-degree Fahrenheit environment. And the others slept without air conditioning, where the temperature hovered around 80. And then they tested students the day after. And what they found was probably what you would expect, that that those who slept in the cooler rooms did better on the test. I mean, simple, simple as that. They just seemed to think better because they thought better, because they slept better, they thought. But the heat, too probably affected their their mood because, as I said, serotonin and dopamine are affected, can affect mood, but also serotonin and dopamine have been linked to concentration and the ability to pay attention and have good executive function. So all the more reason to keep keep working to keep yourself as cool as you can and as hydrated as you can and to get the sleep that you can. So I'm going to repeat again. If you're going to save an energy, save it during the day and and not at night to make sure that you can sleep. The other bit of advice, I think everybody knows this, but sometimes we forget it. Buy a cheap fan. Uh, if if you're in a hot area and you're sweating, then having the air blow on you can also help you cool more quickly. So if you are in a bedroom that is not well cool, get yourself a fan and use that. So I don't know. Abram, have you had any trouble cooling your space and keeping cool? Does any of this resonate to you that, that yeah, maybe I am a little bit more irritable than normal? Or do you think that you're still your jovial, sweet self? Oh, Aww. well, I definitely, you know, if you had asked me this yesterday, I probably wouldn't have said so. But yeah, it, it definitely affects me. Because we had some trouble with the AC when we first moved into our house and uh, have been consistently. Um, So that's annoying, but it's also uh, decreasing my quality of sleep and the amount that I sleep. So I I do imagine that it is definitely affecting my mood. Probably my work ethic. Probably shouldn't say that at work, but uh, yeah, it is. It is definitely got an effect. how much it, how much I can't measure it uh, I should probably do like get one of those like sleep bands or like a like a fit thing fitbit thing or mm-hmm. something to monitor my sleep to see how much that would change it mm-hmm. but I, it definitely does and I've noticed that in the summer months my 
Like I remember even back in like school days, specifically in my second grade classroom, how hot it would get and how much I would be like, I just can't do my work right now. So I, I would be interested to see how much it affects uh, school children as well. Yeah. In their performance. No doubt that it does. Again, because if sleep is affected and serotonin levels are affected and mood is affected, children are going to be less likely to be able to concentrate and and stay with things. So this is sort of across the board, and it's just yet one more indicator that we need to stop separating brain health from the rest of the body health. I think we keep doing that, and there's been a lot of discussion should we quit calling it mental health uh, because that seems to have such a negative connotation and should we just keep calling it all body health or brain health and liver health and heart health or whatever I was about to say because like you don't hear it called like liver health really like I've never heard that before it's, 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 it's just health health but then when it comes to the brain we call it mental and mental has a connotation that some people say is negative. And I'll just say that when we were at, I was at a leadership conference in the American Academy of Pediatrics recently, and there was some discussion about what should we call it. Will, will parents be less likely to accept help if it's called mental versus brain? And I don't think anybody came to a good consensus on that because, you know, you don't want to to minimize the importance of it. But at the same time, you want to maximize the ability to get all the help that you can. So I don't know. I'd love to hear what other people think. Would that make a difference in whether or not you would get the help that you need? Okay, I do want to talk a little bit more about uh, another study that was done in 2021, and it also documented a dip in cognitive thinking performance at air temps when they dropped down, uh, up when they came up to 79 degrees. And what they found as the temperature rose above that, that Our parasympathetic nerve system, that's our anti-stress system that helps us calm and become more relaxed, that response was lowered again. And so the other thing that happened, and this is something to think about, it's not too much science, I don't think, I try not to do too much of this to y'all, but the oxygen satur- saturation levels in the blood were lowered at increased temperature. And if you think about the reason why is because, again, blood flow is often lowered. It's not your cooling mechanism and your circulatory mechanism is not what it, what it should be. And so your oxygen level drops. So all of that is the reason, contributes, not is, but all of that can contribute to the reason of why our bodies have so much trouble and our minds have so much trouble with with dealing with this. So with all of that said, when our parasympathetic system is not working and our stress levels are elevated, what happens to anger and anger control? It falls apart. It, yeah, like where does it go? Where does it go? And I, I will say that you can see it on people's faces when they enter rooms. And just recently, I was at a function where people were coming out of the extreme heat walking into a building. I saw no smiles, not one. I'm a big people watcher. And and I have been impressed at the lack of smiles on individuals' faces, and not only not smiles, but frowns, you know, kind of stomping in and are dragging in uh, with without the ability 
to be able to tolerate it. But, you know, as you're you're thinking about entering a building, that's another thing that can happen is entering a building from that extreme heat to having levels of extreme <laughs> cold, which I've been amazed in some of our buildings in, in our area. I don't know about around the rest of the state or the other southern states, but I've been pretty astounded at the fact that there are some buildings that are keeping their their temperatures uh, hovering around the low 60s or 70. So you're Think about this. You're coming inside and you have a 30 or 35 degree differential from the heat outside to the freezing cold inside. That is also, those those extremes are also not good for you. And yes, indeed, you do think better at around a According to some of the scientists, we think better around 72 to 74 degrees. But to come in from those extreme changes, we do a lot better if we have more more gradual change. So I would encourage the, the monitors of the thermostat systems to do a little bit better job of that. Yeah, I'd imagine it's a bit of a shock to your body, because like I've noticed before, like if you if you, I I've been out in the hot sun, and then if I take a drink of water that's just way too cold, like it'll hurt my throat, but not, and then it hurts my head, and like it just slowly goes over all of you, and like you're just in pain after almost. So. Right, it's it is not good for you that that extreme shift back and forth. So think about it. When we are dealing with 90 to 100 degree weather, your building should probably not be cooler than about 74 to 75. That's pretty cool. And in fact, many say from an energy standpoint, you should ratchet it up to 77 or so. A lot of people don't do that. But what we should really do is dress for the weather, lighter clothes that are airy and flowy, and make sure that that you're not... Uh, dressing for your indoor building. It's ridiculous for people to have to wear sweaters inside this time of year. I'm just saying. Absolutely. My wife does that all the time. Anytime we're going to a restaurant or something, she'll bring a like wool sweater just in case yeah. it is cold in yep. there. And I'm just and everyone looks at her like she's crazy, but like she'll she'll start shivering. Yeah. Many so. people I bet we have lots of people out there who deal with that. Mood, heat, concentration the way it affects your thinking, the way it affects your sense of well-being, and the way, perhaps, it affects your decision-making. So we'll talk about that in the last few minutes, but before we get to that, I also want to remind individuals who are struggling with any kind of mental health disorder and struggling with this heat to keep in mind that it may increase your struggles. It may increase or decrease your sense of well-being. And it may even, as we have talked about a little bit throughout the show, affect the way your medication works. Okay, if you think about hydration alone, if you are dehydrated, Sometimes it can increase the blood levels of some medicine. And so you want to make sure if you're feeling a little bit different or shaky to consult with your your health provider and make sure that you don't need to make some changes. Keep in mind some of your Drugs are filtered through your kidneys. Some of your drugs are filtered through your liver and metabolized through either the kidney or the liver. And so hydration levels can affect that. As as we've mentioned, also it can increase 
your intolerance to the heat sometimes. So I really want to caution individuals, particularly with anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, to to be aware of their medication effects. And if things are feeling wonky to you right now, don't ignore it. Call your pharmacist or call your mental health provider to make sure that that your blood levels are where they need to be, that you don't need to make any adjustments in your medication. Uh, it might be something simple like needing to, to be better hydrated, or it might be something like needing to sleep better, but it could be something else. So I just want to throw out that word of caution. We, we know that suicide rates increase at this time, like I mentioned earlier, domestic violence. Often people who have rage control have more trouble with rage when, when there's this level of heat. So do whatever you can do to make sure that, that, that you're addressing everything that you can. So for people that this applies to, could I just like, like if I'm on medication and I, I do feel weird, can I go to my general practitioner and say, can you test my blood or like, do I need to go to my mental health doctor or like what, what steps should I know to? I would either go, that's a good question. And thank you for asking that. Uh, I would either go to your the person who prescribed the medicine is what I would do. So if that is a mental health provider or if that is your primary care doc, if you or as I mentioned earlier in the show, call your pharmacist and ask them if this could be a reason. Uh, but yes, I would definitely any time, whether you're in the heat or the cold, if you feel like things aren't going as they should, don't tolerate it. Make sure that you call and say, is there something else I can do? Is there something I need to do? We've talked about this on the on the sh- on this show before. It is really, really important for everyone to know that they need to take responsibility for their well-being for their health care, for their mental health care. And I will say this. If you have a provider who does not welcome questions and who say, who does not answer what you have asked to the best of their ability, or if they say, I'm not really sure of that, that's okay. But if you have a, a mental health or a uh, other body health provider who who is not welcoming questions and who is not answering questions, then you need to find another provider. Right. And and I will say, by the way, because I know our office has been guilty of this. Sometimes a patient will call and they'll not hear a call back. And I know that's very, very frustrating. But to make sure if you don't hear a call back, Call back again. If they don't respond to your call, call back. I have patients who do that, and that's fine. I welcome it because it makes makes sure that that inadvertently wasn't missed. You know how things can happen sometimes. You'll read a text and mean, mean to respond and not, or you read an email and mean to respond and not. The same thing can happen to providers. They're human beings. And so to make sure if if there is something going on that you need address to have it addressed, Make sure that you take charge and you push that forward. Now, if that's continually violated and they're not doing it on a regular basis, not addressing your needs on a regular basis, then perhaps that provider's too busy or perhaps that provider um, is not the person for you. So I would encourage people to change that. Okay. So in my final 30 seconds, I'm going to say, 
a couple of things. This is not the time to make snap judgments, okay? This hot weather is not the time to decide that all of a sudden your life is terrible and you need to make all kinds of changes. I want to encourage everybody to stay cool as best they can, stay hydrated, sleep as best they can, and know that this will get better soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Well, Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and the funding is provided in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and support from listeners just like you. If you'd like to hear the show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app by searching Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, engineered by my producer, Abram Nanny, and I think we had a lot of different call screeners. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.